Then they took the helmet um, and they put it on another rat. Uh, gave, gave him the same maze, same cheese, put the helmet on, replayed the electrical impulses. And sure enough, the second rat, who's never seen the maze before, went straight for the cheese, uh, uh, cutting through the shortest path through the maze. Incredible stuff. Um, so how long before we are able to scan our entire brains and exchange them with one another? A kind of a hive mind operation of sorts. Um, you know, and there's a lot of philosophical questions around this. You know, um, if we're able to take, capture the entire contents of the brain and put them on silicon. Well, is there now two of you? One with a body, the other one without? You know, and what happens to uh, the copied versions of the digital you? Um, etc. And you know, all of those are really great questions to ponder, but the thing that um, I'm most interested in is when we're capable of swapping brains with one another, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to swap, uh, uh, well, add to my brain the brain of a genius uh, game developer programmer. In fact, I'll go with few of those so that I can create uh, game-like worlds uh, myself. Um, I bet you the first thing I would create is some kind of an Egypt where I'd get to be um, everyone. Uh, probably start with Pharaoh, obviously. Uh, and then, you know, work my way around. But running at quantum speeds also means that uh, we would then be capable of living hundreds, thousands, perhaps millions of lifetimes in mere days, or perhaps during a single session. And what kind of a person comes out of that session? And uh, I submit to you that uh, you, you would be in, an entirely different person and in fact, um, you would be a kind of a teacher, perhaps even an angel to the rest of us. Um, you would know if you had memories and knowledge and ego and super ego and unconsciousness and subconsciousness um, of, of many other people inside your own brain. Um, you would be able to grapple with questions that we can't even think to ask. Uh, and perhaps the meaning of things would be revealed to the rest of us through you, through kind of an angel. Well, bringing it back to Philip K. Dick uh, and his uh, propensity, fandom, what's the word I'm looking for? Philip K. Dick's... Um, love of playing with time um, and having time run backwards uh, in many of his movies and uh, well <laughs> movies of course movies and TV series um, of course uh, uh, these concepts were explored greatly in his books uh, which I've now been revealed as never have read uh, so there you have it uh, but I'm familiar with his um, talks, and uh, he talks about backwards time a lot. And it's uh, just this idea. So let's use Star Trek uh, and Gene Roddenberry as an example. We could say that we are essentially living in uh, Gene Roddenberry's future. Gene Roddenberry, you know, 50 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, 40, whatever it was, the original Star Trek was... Yeah, yeah, a long time ago, 60s? The, the Next Generation came out in 87. Uh, Star Trek Discovery, which came out uh, uh, in 2017, 30 years later after TNG, is wonderful, by the way. Um, so, in order for Gene Roddenberry to imagine uh, technology such as Holodeck or a universal uh, language translator, technologies that today are commonplace, 
you know, uh, Oculus Rift, virtual reality, augmented reality, Magic Leap, um, uh, Google Translator, uh, uh, that's universal. There's, there's a whole slew of technology. Uh, the idea uh, of moneyless society, um, reputation-based economy, uh, there's all these things that Gene Roddenberry had envisioned in his mind's eye, which he then literally created simply by writing them down, uh, which then later turned into TV series, which then inspired countless geeks to materialize Gene Roddenberry's vision. Um, so you can kind of start to see how, uh, for some people, the time moves backwards, and Gene Roddenberry would be one of those people because he was way ahead of his time. Um, and we're just catching up to his imagination uh, uh, these days. Um, so, so tying Nietzsche's uh, um, uh, Ubermensch with uh, this um, Gene Roddenberry's um, vision of the future and then technology um, bringing us closer and closer to gods, you can see how Philip K. Dick's backwards time would come into play because, um, or Terence McKenna, there's a kind of an attractor at the end of time. Um, we're not so much being pushed by the past as much as we are being pulled by the future. Uh, that's another way to conceptualize it. There's, uh, there's some fascinating uh, uh, talks on YouTube from Terence McKenna. Um, as well as Philip K. Dick, uh, where they go into time. Uh, just a bit like, don't ask which one, just watch them all. Anyways, in other words, it was uh, beings of another order or of creation, the humanity who gave the chosen people their Kabbalah, right? So uh, beings of another order, those of us who managed to get implanted with nanobots and... Uh, benefit from AI integration and I mean that digital to organic AI integration in other words deep deep integration where there's no way of telling where one begins and the other one ends where uh, AI processing power at a quantum level is available to humans um, we could then perhaps make concrete these concepts that are now magical and esoteric, etc. And the way we might do that is quite practical um, for ourselves, within our own minds, because at the point of nanobots floating inside your CBR, uh, uh, cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, what's a CBR? Anyways, um, you, at that point, can create whatever reality you want, and it's the matrix thing. What is real? If it's an electric impulse, then, you know, uh, your brain is just that, an electrically impulse-led and driven machine. Uh, so we could, in fact, become sort of gods inside our own minds. Um, in not exactly metaphorical way. Anyways, to the modern mind, this may seem as absurd a statement as the doctrine that babies are found under gooseberry bushes. Well, to the modern mind of, 19, of 1835, 19, 1835, 1935, I believe. Um, yeah, that makes sense. 1935. Um, but if we study the many mystical systems of uh, comparative religion, we find that all the Illuminati are in agreement upon this point. All men and women who have had practical experience of the spiritual life tell us that they are taught by divine beings. We shall be very foolish if we altogether disregard such a cloud of witnesses, especially those of us 
who have never had any personal experience of the higher states of consciousness. Right. So uh, what the unfortunate is saying here is that, you know, if some people are claiming some things, you'd be well advised to be skeptical. Certainly. But don't be too skeptical. Um, Alan Watts has a great way of saying it during his lectures. He says, leave your beliefs at the door. You can get them on the way out. Uh, so it's very important to approach things with a new mind of sorts as a child. Um, and instead say, hmm, perhaps there's something to this. Um, in which way is there something to this? In which way is there not something to this? These are good questions. There are some psychologists who will tell you tell us that the angels of the Kabbalists and the gods of the Manus of other systems are our own repressed complexes. Sounds very Freudian. There are others with less limited outlook who will tell us that these divine beings are the latent capacities of our own higher selves. Okay, I can see that as a less limited outlook. Okay. To the devotional mystic, this is not a point of any great moment. He gets his results, and that is all he cares about. I can relate to this. This, I like. The results. But the philosophical mystic, in other words, the occultist, thinks the matter out and arrives at certain conclusions. These conclusions, however, can only be understood when we know what we mean by reality and have a clear line of demarcation between the subjective and the objective. Anyone who is trained in philosophical method knows that this is asking a good deal, indeed. The Indian schools of metaphysics have most elaborate and intricate systems of philosophy which attempt to define these ideas and render them thinkable. The Indian schools of metaphysics go far back indeed. They have a lot of preserved writings. It is indeed an ancient culture. Okay. And uh, though generations of seers have given their lives to the task, the concepts still remain so abstract that it is only after a long course of discipline called yoga in the East that the mind is able to apprehend them at all. Um, this relates to the proper level of analysis, which we often fail to address. Um, there is an infinite number of uh, levels, turtles all the way down and up, as it turns out. And finding the right turtle is paramount. Um, otherwise, you're talking at each other or communicating uh, across two different levels and uh, finding common ground there becomes more difficult because there are, well, levels in between. The Kabbalist uh, goes to work in a different way. Oh yeah? How? He does not attempt to make the mind rise up on the wings of metaphysics into the rarefied air of abstract reality. He formulates a concrete symbol that the eye can see and lets it represent the abstract reality that no untrained human mind can grasp. So the idea here is to write it down and to create your own set of symbols. Um, remember how mocked uh, Dick Cheney was, and believe me, I'm no fan of Dick Cheney, for inventing his own um, uh, top secret designation. I forgot what it was. But... My God, I mean, if I'm a vice president, why not? Um, and if I'm a vice president and why not, then why not if I'm not a white vice president? So it's something to think about for all of us. Uh, I like the idea of um, creating cognitive thought forms, as uh, Aubrey Forrest likes to say, the modern-day alchemist. 
It is exactly the same principle as algebra. I thought so, yeah, because uh, words, words and letters are a kind of um, abstract reality. Uh, an untrained mind could not be able to grasp these letters nor sounds unless you spoke English and wrote English. Um, so it is exactly the same principle as algebra. All right. Let x represent the unknown quantity, let y represent the half of x, and let z represent something we know. If we begin to experiment with y to find out its relation to z and, if what, and in what proportion, it soon ceases to be entirely unknown. We have learned something at any rate about it, and if we are sufficiently skillful, we may in the end be able to express y in terms of z, and then we shall begin to understand x. Oh, okay, that's a lot of, uh, 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 it's a big paragraph to say, um, variables. There are a great many symbols which are used as objects of meditation. The cross of Christendom, the god forms in the Egyptian system, the phallic symbols in other faiths. These symbols are used by the uninitiated as a means of con con concentrating the mind and introducing into it certain thoughts calling upon certain associated ideas and stimulating certain feelings. The initiate, however, uses a symbol system differently. He uses it in an algebra by means of which he will read the secrets of unknown potencies. In other words, he uses the symbol as a means of guiding thought out into the unseen and incomprehensible. A way to get out of one's head, perhaps, uh, methinks. And how does he do this? He does it by using a composite symbol. A symbol which is an unattached unit would not serve his purpose. A symbol which is an, uh, an unattached unit would not serve his purpose. In contemplating such a composite symbol as the tree of life, he observes that there are definite relations between its parts. There are some parts of which he knows something, there are other, others of which he can intuit something, or more crudely, make a guess, a reason from first principles. This is pretty important. Um, f finding um, the principle, the foundation, uh, where you can no longer stick a crowbar and lift it up and see if there's anything underneath. Um, but like you got to do that. You put the crowbar underneath, lift it up, anything underneath. If you can't find anything underneath, try again. Um, but keep trying until you can't get any further down into the foundation. Uh, and that, that's your first principle. Uh, you can arbitrarily designate a first principle. Um, as long as the reasoning from that principle um, is valid, particularly uh, if judged by others as well as yourself. Anyways, enough of that. The mind leaps from one known to another known and in so doing traverses certain distances, metaphorically speaking. It is like a traveler in the desert who knows the situation of two oases and makes a forced march between them. He would never have dared to push out into the desert from the first oasis if he had not known the location of the second. But at the end of his journey, he not only knows much more about the characteristics of the second oasis, but he also observed the country lying between them thus making forced marches from oasis to oasis backwards and forwards across the desert he gradually explores it nevertheless the desert is incapable of supporting life so this is a very beautifully laid out uh, a transition between point a point b we're always going from point a to point b we cast our vision both uh, internal and external one towards uh, places where we'd like to move towards to. I'm intentionally using too many of these forward-moving words. Um, the, um, the oasis represents a kind of an Eden, a kind of unknown order, uh, while desert represents a chaos. 
Uh, and of course, we can see this kind of chaos ordered economy in, in, in everything, in our, certainly in our everyday lives. Um, certainly in the way, for example, um, uh, say, uh, any town USA is compared to a um, uh, Brazilian jungle. Uh, one would certainly be chaos for some, while the other one would certainly be an Eden for others. So, uh, so this is very poetically put, and, and, and it also has a lot of practical application, and if you are in need of more on that, you should check out Jordan Peterson on YouTube and elsewhere. So it is with the Kabbalistic system of notation. The things, in, uh, the things it renders are unthinkable, and yet the mind, tracking from symbol to symbol, manages to think about them. And although we have to be content to see in a glass darkly, yet we have every reason to hope that ultimately we shall see face to face and know even as we are known. For the human mind grows by exercise, and that which was at first as unthinkable as mathematics to the child who cannot manage his sums, finally comes within the range of our realization. By thinking about a thing, we build concepts of it. I'd suggest going a step further. I'm a big fan of uh, speaking my mind, writing my thoughts, speaking things I'm reading. If I can permanently <clears throat> record them in some way, that's even better. And let's not forget, Gene Roddenberry did exactly that. He took his paper notebook, he took his pen, and uh, he wrote down Star Trek. And some 50 years later, his visions have come to pass, many of them. You may remember aforementioned Holodeck Universal Language Translator and Moneyless Society. Oh, the Moneyless Society didn't come to pass yet. It will soon. It is said that uh, thought grew out of language. Interesting. It is said that thought grew out of language, not language out of thought. Who would have thought? I would certainly assume it was the other way around. All right, Dion Fortune, you got my attention now. What words are to thought? Symbols are to intuition. What words are to thought? Symbols are to intuition. It's interesting. So, intuition is a little more vague, and symbols are a little more vague. So, it's perhaps that vagueness, the blurring of the boundaries, if you will, between the intuition and symbols, that it, uh, it allows the two to kind of dissolve into one another and be recognized as such. This is... Um, some pretty good thinking, uh, Dion Fortune. Curious as it may seem, the symbol precedes the elucidation. So that's why they say that thought grew out of language, because the symbol precedes the elucidation. That's worth meditating on. This is why we declare that the Kabbalah is a growing system, not a historic monument. Any thing, a certainly, certainly a system, um, would have to be a, an evolving thing. Else, Kabbalah, as it was practiced, say, thousands of years ago, uh, would probably be of little use to a modern, modern individual. This is a huge assumption on my part, but um, my Western logic tells me that that's right. Um, although I don't trust my Western logic too far, so take that with a grain of salt. 
There is more to be got out of the Kabbalistic symbols to today than there was in the time of the old dispensation because our mental content is richer in ideas. That's very interesting. Um, so that is certainly one way in which a system could grow. It, it would be one way in which uh, it couldn't be a monument um, because there's new things that need to be contextualized in old ways. How much more, for instance, does the Sephiral Yesod, wherein work the forces of growth and reproduction, mean to the biologist than to the ancient rabbi? Everything that has to do with growth and reproduction is resumed in the sphere of the moon. But this sphere, as represented upon the tree of life, is set about with paths leading to other Sephiroth. It's an interesting word. Let's find out what Sephirot means. Okay, <clears throat> Sephirah. Okay, in Kabbalism, each of the ten attributes or emanations. Wow. Uh, when you enter a new space, industry, realm, domain, knowledge domain, that's a good way to think about it. Uh, whenever you enter a new uh, knowledge domain, and alchemy is certainly a new knowledge domain for me, um, certainly in like a serious way, you know, I've always had a passing, well, let's say childlike interest in it, um, or at least my approach to it was childlike, whereas I feel my approach today is uh, slightly uh, more inter intermediate. Um, in any case, whenever you enter a new domain uh, knowledge sphere, it's um, you encounter a lot of new terms. Sepira. Sepira. Um, and, um, and that's cool. Um, but it also means that you find yourself looking up a lot of Sephiroths in the process. Okay. Therefore, the biological Kabbalist knows that there must be certain definite relationship between the forces subsumed in Yesod and those represented by the symbols assigned to these paths. Brooding over these symbols, he gets glimpsed of relationships that do not reveal themselves when the material aspect of things is considered. And when he comes to work, the, these out in the material of his studies, he finds that therein are hidden important clues. And so upon the tree, one thing leads to another, explanation of hidden causes arising out of the proportions and relations of the various individual symbols composing this, might synthetic, this mighty synthetic glyph. Hufa. Hu. That's a long sentence. With a lot of um, punctuations in between. I hope uh, some of that made sense. He's just saying meditate on the tree of life. Each symbol, moreover, admits of interpretation upon the different planes and through its astrological associations can be related to the gods of any pantheon thus open up vast new fields of implication in which the mind range, ranges endlessly. Symbol leading onto symbol in an unbroken chain of association. Symbol confirming symbol as the many branching threads gather themselves together into a synthetic glyph once more, and each symbol capable of interpretation in terms of whatever plane the mind may be functioning upon. Well, I find this once again a reiteration of the original concept that we each bring to this our own thing. This mighty, all embracing glyph of the soul of man and of the universe, by virtue of its logical association of symbols, evokes images in the mind. But these images are not randomly evolved, but follow along well-defined association tracks in the universal mind. In the universal mind. So that must have been a way to express something like 
the collective unconsciousness that was later formalized by Jung. Um, they've had words for it prior, universal mind, that makes sense. Moving on, the symbol of the tree is to the universal mind what the dream is to the individual ego. It is a glyph synthesized from subconsciousnesses. I love pluralized subconsciousnesses. <laughs> To represent the hidden forces. Right, so let's bring this into the realm of uh, fantasy and science. Let's see, but these are not randomly, but follow along well defined. Ego, it's close. Okay, so let's highlight that part. It's a glyph synthesized from subconsciousnesses as, 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 to represent the hidden forces. Okay, so how might we uh, conceive of this uh, today? Um, to go to um, uh, something that's really near and dear to my heart as the first example, um, I call to witness Stargate SG-1. Um, if you've watched that show, if you haven't watched that show, I highly recommend it just for the uh, pure wealth of Egyptian lore. <clears throat> you'll, you'll get really well versed in Egyptian gods and modalities by watching Stargate. It's an incredible TV show. Wonderfully done. Uh, and on such a tiny budget. And uh, they have a couple of really nice movies too. In any case, the um, running nemesi of the human race is this uh, species called Gua'uld. Sometimes called Gould. Um, well, Gua'uld are these eel-looking things, but a lot more vicious, closer to a piranha. Imagine if piranha and eel had a baby. Um, that's Gould in its, what they call, a larval form. It's a larva of some sort or another. <clears throat> and anyways, if you come near its lake... Uh, this is a minor spoiler. Um, if you come near its lake, it can jump inside you and take over uh, control of your body. Um, so that's kind of cool. But here's the uh, part that's really cool. When they take over your body, they can do magical things um, because within them there is a um, full memory of every Gua'uld in, in that particular Gua'uld's lineage. Um, there's a collective memory down the genetic DNA chain. And that is such a cool idea. Um, the idea that uh, you know le we could we could pass down no uh, language, let's say, genetically, um, is um, it's just incredible. Um, it also seems to sort of supercharge the uh, hosts and this. Example, that would be you, because a little piranha eel jumped into your mouth and took over your body, um, as the story went. Um, your, um, your, also, your intellect is supercharged somehow, and I don't know which one causes which. Um, is it this genetic memory or is this uh, um, super intellect that somehow revivifies dormant genetic memory, perhaps in the host, 
and perhaps in the um, entire DNA chain going down to, you know, God knows how far. So that's a really cool concept. Um, and when Dion Fortune talks about these hidden forces, he means things like that, uh, except uh, um, the Stargate example is not real. Or is it? We <clears throat> understood, we understand that uh, uh, there is a, a tremendously strong argument to be made uh, for um, humans. N this is not exclusive to humans. This is all species and all things, in fact. Um, that uh, we do pass down certain kinds of knowledge genetically. Um, so, for example, uh, every baby uh, is smart enough not to run off a cliff. And this is interesting. Apparently, there's been studies done um, where they obviously simulate the kind of an environment where it looks like babies going to uh, crawl off the cliff. So these are not walking babies. These are crawling babies. Crawling babies. It's a great name for a, for a punk band. Um, so crawling babies have this innate uh, ability to detect uh, depth depth perception um, and uh, back away from a cliff uh, this is uh, this is so it's an innate thing um, there's a famous story about Charles Darwin <coughs> excuse me um, he would go to um, I guess Museum of Natural Art or something like that uh, wherever he lived uh, and uh, he would uh, um, stare at a snake. A snake was inside an aquarium. Um, and he would look at the snake and he would try to rid himself of what seemed like a compulsion, inevitable compulsion, to pull one head, one's, his head back every time the snake, cobra I believe, would lunge at him. Uh, he, he tried to train himself to like stay in the pocket and look the snake square in the eye and not move. But every time that snake lunged forward, beyond his control, he pulled back. Um, you've seen videos of cats uh, turn around to see a cucumber and jump in the air. These videos are hilarious. Um, what the cat is thinking is not cucumber. The cat is thinking, oh, maybe snake, better run away. Um, so, so this is a clear example, uh, and I think of these hidden forces that shape us, because those of us who didn't fall off a branch of a tree uh, while we were uh, uh, aping it up um, in the canopies of uh, uh, archaic jungles uh, and those of us who were smart enough to snap away from a snake like objects uh, have managed to evolve into you know the species that exists today that that same impulse that exists in us to back to snap back from a snake attack exists in cats as well. So it's coming from a common ancestry. I mean, that's not uh, uh, evidence of genetic memory. It's hard for me um, to imagine what might be. And, and I fear we underestimate um, how many things are like that. So this was not... Well, this was clearly understood by the mystics of the early 1900s. Um, I wonder how many of us think about these things today. The universe's reality is really a thought form projected from the mind of God. I mean, that's worth a pause. Um, I've come to accept 
the point of view that uh, the universe, um, the whole of reality is in my head. Um, simulation theory, I'm totally on board. <clears throat> Not to say that I believe that that's true. But rather that I find it useful to think so. And that's true enough for me. Anyways. The Kabbalistic tree might be likened to a dream picture arising from the subconsciousness of God and dramatizing the subconscious content of deity. In other words, if the universe is the conscious end product of the mental activity of the Logos, the tree is the symbolic representation of the raw material of the divine consciousness and of the process sees, whereby the universe come into being. In other words, if the universe is the conscious end product of the mental activity of the Logos, so in other words, if we accept the previous statement to be true, universes are really a thought form projected from the mind of God. It's hard. It's yeah. I'm not pointing it out for fear that I may sound obvious when I say that when Dion Fortune says God, he means you. He means me. He means him. Okay. Uh, in other words, if the universe is the conscious end product of the mental activity of the Logos, the tree is the symbolic representation of the raw material of the divine consciousness and of the processes whereby the universe comes into being. But the tree applies not only to the macrocosm, but to the micro microcosm, which, as all occultists realize, is a replica in a miniature. That's the biblical concept of as above, so below, and as below, so above. It is for this reason that divination is possible. That you always have to watch out for when the writer puts two sentences together. Because he's making leaps, jumps, like on a monkey bars. He's making leaps from one thought to another. And as you're leaping, you may grab a, another monkey bar in any direction. Which direction you grab that monkey bar in determines the way in which you think and in which you process your thoughts and come to a logical conclusion, maybe, or a desirable conclusion, however you measure it. So, the tree applies not only to the macrocosm, okay, so as above, so below. So he's linking the concept, as above, so below, and then he says, it's for that reason that divination is possible. So that means that at whatever level you're operating at, if you divine heaven into existence at that level heaven will get manifested and divined across all levels so that's not quite the secret right? this is putting a much finer point on this this is much closer to what Jordan Peterson talks about um and you know, clean your room. And um, and if you set those things straight at that level, then things will line up at all other levels, as above, so below. As 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 a, you, you you forget that you're always in the middle of that, right? Don't forget that you're always in the middle of that. So. 
there's something above, there's something below always. And it doesn't matter what it is, uh, it has to pass through you, and it is through you. that things get balanced. And if you clean your room at your level of analysis, the level where, at which you reside, then automatically the room gets cleaned top down, across all levels, across all dimensions. That's good stuff. And then, so first of all, it's true. Let's 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 find out if it's true. <coughs> let's find out if it's true. So, um, if uh, if I clean up the room. Um, Let's have heaven manifest right there. So as far as I know, it's true. And if I walk outside and it's not, well, then that's the next level or the next turtle. As above, so below. And then, of course, you keep doing that and it never ends. Turtles all the way down, all the way up. Great. What if it's not true? Well, if you do it, it's still true for you. There's probably a more profound way to understand that. <sighs> but I'm feeling a little under pressure right now. Performance anxiety, perhaps. Okay, that little understood and much maligned art has for its philosophical basis the system of correspondences represented by symbols. Mm -hmm. Like floors in a building. The On some level of analysis, the correspondences between the soul of man and the universe are not arbitrary, but arise out of developmental identities. Certain aspects of consciousness were developed in response to certain phases of evolution and therefore embody the same principles. Consequently, they react to the same influences. A man's soul is like a lagoon connected with the sea by a submerged channel. Although to all outward seeming it is landlocked, nevertheless, its water level rises and falls with the tides of the sea because of hidden connection. So it is with human consciousness. So there is a subconscious connection between each individual soul and the world soul, deep hidden in the most primitive depths of subconsciousnesses. And in consequence, we share in the rise and fall of the cosmic tides. Indeed. So <clears throat> this is very easy to uh, uh, talk about in scientific terms uh, today. Uh, I don't know what kind of understanding these guys have had 100 years ago about uh, um, our um, uh, mycelial origins. <clears throat> if you're uh, not familiar with uh, this theory, um, it's more than a theory. It's uh, quite the proven uh, uh, fact that, well, we all come from fungi. Um, First, there were fungi, and uh, then there were extinctions. And because of the fungi, nature of the fungi, and fungi, you know, if you th think of a starfish and you cut off all the um, um, legs, let's call them, from the starfish, it regenerates. You, like, you cut it in half, builds two, two starfish. Um, and so mycelium is, um, is like that times 11. Uh, mycelium is, well, the largest organism in the world. 
is uh, somewhere in Oregon, and um, and it's um, it's a uh, fungi. It's a fungi forest and underground uh, internet. Uh, there's again, as above, so below. Um, internet of um, mycelium cells. Um, so, so as it turns out, both animals and plants have one ancestry in common: fungi. Uh, it appears that whichever species paired up with uh, fungi after and during extinctions um, managed to somehow survive. And going far enough in the fossil records, you hit the floor, and that floor is mushroom. Um, so it's a very interesting, uh, interesting fact. So there's a, a subconscious connection between each individual soul and the world soul. most primitive depths of consciousness. And as a consequence, we share in the rise and fall of the cosmic tides. Right. Well, there's that extinction event business that I mentioned earlier. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot to be said uh, uh, for this. If our all of our common ancestry is fungi, and that seems to be the case, nobody's more surprised than me. So if all goes back to fungi, and we know that things such as depth perception and uh, um, fear of cats, uh, sorry, fear of um, snakes, um, transcends species such as monkeys and humans and cats. Um, what else and at what level are these, these core programs, core routines that are being executed at every moment and at every level, uh, what are those core routines that are always running? This is quite like the Matrix, isn't it? It's very cool. <clears throat> Let me get some more. Hang on. Each symbol upon the tree represents a cosmic force or factor. When the mind concentrates upon it, it comes into touch with that force. Well, that's a nice promise. You just have to concentrate on it. Okay. In other words, a surface channel, a channel in consciousness, has been made between the conscious mind of the individual and a particular factor in the world soul, and through this channel the waters of the ocean pour into the lagoon. I like how poetic Dion Fortune is. His metaphors are just... Mwah. The aspirant who uses the tree as his meditation symbol establishes point by point the union between his soul and the world soul. This results in a tremendous access of energy to the individual soul. It is this which, it is this which endows it with magical powers. Well, sure, if you could surf the stream of the universe, you would be Mr. Universe. Somebody write that down. But just as the universe must be ruled by God, so must, so, so must the many-sided soul of man be ruled by its God, the spirit of man. The higher self must dominate its universe or there will be unbalanced force. Each factor will rule its own aspect and they will war among themselves. Then do we have the rule of the kings of Edom whose kingdoms are unbalanced force. Yikes, I don't know what that means. Thus, do we see in the tree a glyph of the soul of man and the universe and in the legends associated with in the history of the evolution of the soul and the way of initiation. I don't know why these sentences sound like they should be ending with a question mark, but they aren't. 
let's see that one more time because the chapter is done so but just as the universe must be ruled by god so must the many-sided soul of man be ruled by its god the spirit of man okay that so far so good the higher self must dominate this universe or there will be unbalanced force the higher self must dominate its universe or they will be unbalanced forced sure each factor will rule its own aspect and they will war among themselves okay i want to come back and they will war among i want to come back to that then do we have the rule of the kings of edom whose kingdoms are unbalanced force okay we're going to explore that last sentence in a second um, so this reminds me of Carl Jung's, um, I think it was Carl Jung who said something like, um, inside the mind of every man, there's a basement and in that basement, there's a hatch. And when you open up that hatch, you find, um, 10,000, uh, different personalities, uh, you know, hidden, locked away under the hatch in the basement all those guys live inside us uh, so uh, and and many of them live on the first and second and third floor so um i can certainly identify with this they will war among themselves i believe our good author means inside ourselves now let's see this edom let's look up edom I think we're going to need some context here. Oh, it's a former country. Edom was an ancient kingdom in Transjordan, located between Moab, I love saying that word, Moab, to the northeast, the Araba to the west, and the Arabian desert to the south and east. Most of its former territory is now divided between Israel and Jordan. Edom appears in written sources relating to the Late Bronze Age and to the Iron Age in the Levant, such as the Hebrew Bible and Egyptian Mesopotamian records. Okay, so it's a former country. So then do we have the rule of the kings of Edom whose kingdoms are unbalanced forced? Not quite sure I understand what the author is trying to say there, but I hope that you do. Thus do we see in the tree of glyph of the soul of man in the universe and in the legends associated with it the history of the evolution of the soul and the way of initiation. Ah, oh, that I had to read it inside my own mind in order to understand it. Um, When he says, thus do we see in the glyph, or in the tree a glyph, I think what he's trying to say is, um, okay, so now do you see uh, what I mean? He's like, know what I mean? I think that's what he's saying. And that concludes chapter three. Chapter four is the unwritten Kabbalah. Ooh, spooky.